Welcome everyone to our webinar on overcoming adversity in sales. And uh, while we're waiting for folks to join, please enter in the chat. Uh, let us know your name, where you're joining us from. We're excited to engage with you over the next um, hour. This has been uh, an incredibly popular topic. We are excited at the response that we've gotten. So we do have um, quite a crowd joining us. And again, we really want to hear from you. Please feel free to enter your name and where you're joining us from in the chat. Uh, a few housekeeping items. This webinar will be recorded and it will be sent out um, to all registrants. Look at this. We've got uh, Kathy, Chris, David, man, people from all over. This is so exciting. Glad to hear from you all. Please, as we go, um, please enter any comments uh, in the chat. Feel free to send us questions through the Q&A um, and we will uh, try to get to those as we go. We're going to kick it off. I am so excited to be joined today um, by our CEO, Spence Wixom. Hi, Spence. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Michelle. It is so great to be here. I've looked so much forward to this, and I really appreciate everyone in this audience who has uh, registered for this and who's joining us today. I just wanted to highlight some of the different industries we have uh, joining us. We have people from technology, healthcare, education, transportation and logistics, manufacturing, financial services companies. And we also have um, some individuals from a few branches of our armed forces. And I just want to say we appreciate all of the great work you're doing in your various industries. And for those who are serving in our armed forces, we just greatly appreciate your service and excited to have all of you uh, joining us today. Uh, I'm just very much looking forward to getting to know everyone and having a very productive conversation. Really appreciate all of the feedback as well and the questions that were answered in the registration. We're going to share with you a little bit of data and perspective that comes as a direct result of, of that. Thank you, Spence. And I echo your comments and appreciation for the industries that have joined for the military. Um, one of the great things about um, being with the Brooks Group is that opportunity to work with organizations across a wide range of sales environments. Um, and you mentioned um, getting to know uh, the participants uh, through the, the questions and the registrations. I want to take a little bit of time and get to know you. And I think <laughs> our, um, our audience would appreciate that as well. So um, tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. So I, I've been in a lot of different jobs in my career. And uh, as I look back on it, I realize that each of those experiences was really a sales job. I had a, a finance professor in uh, college who uh, said to us, I know a lot of you are in these finance classes because you don't want to go into sales. Uh, let me be honest with you and upfront with you on the first day. Every job is a sales job. And I've found that to be true in my career. I started wanting to be a lawyer, uh, did an internship at the U.S. Supreme Court, and I found that my internship was all around persuading the justices to pay attention to the art that's hanging on the walls of their chambers. And so I was, in a sense, selling them on, on that idea, right? Because people would come in to visit their chambers and ask, tell me about that painting on the wall. And the justices didn't want to uh, look foolish. And so my briefs helped educate them around that. Uh, I did a stint in radio sales in college that helped me kind of understand uh, what the profession was all about. Did a little bit of time in investment banking where I was selling smaller businesses on going to market to sell to larger businesses. Had a few years in real estate where I was selling landowners on selling their land for uh, residential development and construction. And then I realized just over all of those different sales related experiences, how much I loved the theory and the concept behind the profession. So I decided to make sales enablement, sales development, training, et cetera, uh, my career. And that's what I've been doing for the last 17 years, uh, doing research, implementing sales principles in organizations, large and small, all over the world. Uh, and that's ultimately what brought me here to the Brooks Group. So you've been with us um, for several months now. What got you excited about joining the Brooks Group? One of the things, so I, I've also taught sales at the university level. And what I found when I was teaching these undergrad students the principles of selling is how important it is to have simple, elegant uh, principles 
and solutions in selling. And when I uh, became familiar with um, the impact selling method and with uh, Michelle, your book, Agile and Resilient, which was one of the first things that I read, I saw a great elegance or simplicity in uh, the principles that Bill Brooks founded and that have been a part of this organization for the many years since then. and got me really excited was to be part of that organization. The other thing that got me really excited is all of the effort that goes into understanding individuals. You know, if individual salespeople don't understand themselves and appreciate their strengths and their development areas, uh, it's very hard to help them become better. And all of the work that this great organization does around strengthening individual understanding, an appreciation for where you may be strong, where you may uh, need development around all of these different components of selling got me really excited as well. Awesome. And we're excited to have you. So who are you outside of work? Because <laughs> it can't all be about um, work. Sales is fun and sales is great, but who are you outside of that? You know, like we used to say about investment banking, right? People ask me, yeah, how do you like the job? I say, I like it best the first 14 hours of the day, but, uh, and I'm kidding. Um, but uh, outside of work, my most important thing right now is I have a wonderful wife and three beautiful children who I try to spend as much time with as I can. Uh, we've had a fun summer vacation. Uh, we came here to North Carolina uh, to the uh, uh, Brooks Group headquarters for our summer vacation, but we also spent some time in the mountains and spent some time at the beach, which are two places I absolutely love to go with my kids. Awesome. Well, thank you for um, giving us a glimpse into who you are. Um, and as I said, we're happy to have you here. And um, I know you're going to share some outstanding insights with the group today. We're here to talk about overcoming adversity in sales. So let's maybe dig into that. Let's do it. And, and as Michelle said, we, are, we have gathered some of your feedback. We put together some principles we're excited to share with you. But we also want to hear from you as we're going through this conversation uh, to raise questions, to raise comments as we go. And we will try as we can to stop and address those as we go. And of course, also leave some time open at the end of our conversation for some last minute questions as well. So I'm going to drive, um, share my screen here. And uh, let's talk first about the situation that we find ourselves in, in the sales profession today. And this is something that's been analyzed quite a bit by a lot of different organizations gathering data here, uh, particularly the last couple of years as we've gone through some real turbulent times in COVID and in post-COVID. Here's some of the things that we know. Right? First of all, there's a ton of noise out there. There's a lot being presented. There's a lot being communicated, disseminated through digital channels and elsewise. And we know uh, individuals are just bombarded with the number of advertisements and points of outreach that they may see in any given day. Uh, we also know that buyers really prefer today uh, digital interactions, engaging with oftentimes at the beginning on their own uh, with the digital ecosystem of uh, their um, vendors and suppliers who are, who are selling to them. Uh, we also know that they tend to gather a lot of that information. They tend to try to draw consensus among the various members of the buying group before they reach proactively out to uh, various salespeople. Gartner, this is something that Gartner has been studying for quite a number of years, the, the growth and the size of these buying groups and the amount of time that individuals spend doing research on their own before they engage uh, actively with salespeople. And finally, and this is probably a more recent uh, occurrence, but it's one that's been very highly studied in a couple of pockets, particularly uh, by a good friend of mine, Matt Dixon, over at DCM Insights and, and his partners, uh, opportunities, many opportunities are ending in no decision outcomes today. And it's interesting, the group here gave us a lot of that feedback. We saw that from individuals. Hey, I'm having a hard time in that final mile close. I'm having a hard time getting the ultimate decision makers to sign on the dotted line, as it were, and get the deal done. And this is something you're not alone in feeling, those of you who express that, uh, many opportunities these days are, are stalling out to indecision. And we're going to talk about that as we go through this conversation. So 
those are some of the struggles we're seeing in the sales space. Where does that leave salespeople today? A uh, couple of different things that we're seeing out there. Number one, we're seeing win rates uh, falling from what was previously, and this is some research by Winning by Design, over 30% win rates down to sometimes below 20% in certain sectors. So we're seeing it much more difficult to Again, find those opportunities, cultivate those opportunities, and, and get those opportunities closed. Number two, this is having an effect on sellers' ability to perform. Uh, many are not expecting to hit quota uh, this year. They're feeling a lot of stress and a lot of pressure uh, to hit those numbers when they see fewer opportunities in the pipeline in uh, a lower win rate percentage. And then finally, as a result of that, it's it's affecting them emotionally. 73% uh, are considering quitting as a direct result of some of the mental health concerns or uh, the stress and the discouragement that's coming as a result of a more difficult sales environment. So there's, there's a lot of emotional reaction that's happening among salespeople. It's chipping away at confidence and uh, their really desire and ability to do the job. Michelle, any comments from you on, on what we're seeing here? Well, I mean, I, I think um, certainly on, on the, the mental health issue, um, you know, we're going to share some data coming up around, you know, how that really impacts mindset. Um, and I, I also think, you know, when you think about sellers not expecting to hit quota in 2023, for many industries, many organizations, it's been um, boom times, right, over the last several years. So, um, this is really calling in um, sellers having to, to kind of call on a different skill set, right? So they may be used to those deals just coming in the door, the phone just ringing, and now they're having to, to exercise some new skills. I can certainly see um, how this is impacting um, sellers' potentially mindset and, and their overall ability to perform. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's let's kind of correlate that. What we are seeing here, what we're seeing out in the market, um, the effect that that's having on salespeople, with what we heard from this audience specifically. Uh, we asked everyone, what are the key, like most significant struggles that you're dealing with in your sales force? And and really, we were able to allocate all of those answers, and and we appreciate them uh, into three general categories. And let let's share with you what the percentage of respondents said in, in each of these. So number one, struggling for buyer access or, or lead flow. Uh, almost 40% of the comments that we received uh, spoke specifically to that. They talked about uh, cold calling difficulty, converting leads, booking meetings, getting potential customers to call you back were a lot of what uh, people said there. So that's clearly a, a key struggle among this group and in something that we are seeing more generally. Number two, struggling to close deals in that, that final stage. Uh, as I uh, said before, 13% of the comments dealt directly with that. They said um, uh, they're looking for, uh, it's too long for customers to make a final decision. It's just the close is dragging out, getting a group decision on buying. These were some of the things that they shared with us. Now, the largest, uh, section of comments we got was just around struggling to hire, develop, and, and retain good sellers. Some of the things that they highlighted were sellers' ability to root cause opportunities, overcoming objections, progressing the sales process, being able to clearly articulate value to customers uh, were some of the specific struggles there. Um, but it is, it's very interesting, we found that all of the Diverse comments tended to have one of these three themes. So there's a struggle to get access at the top of the funnel. There's a struggle to pull those deals in at the final mile. And there's just a general struggle to keep sellers, to get the right sellers, number one, to keep them engaged, retain them, keep them motivated in doing the job. Yeah, and I mean, did, I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Michelle. Well, no, I was just going to say, I think it's, you know, you're starting to get that cycle, right? You, um, if you're struggling to get um, prospects in the funnel, then you've got less to even then be able to close. So then that mindset of, of um, not hitting quota, 
um, then it causes issues kind of with, with self-confidence, which then, you know, cycles back around again. So I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think we can see why it's a selling in adversity, right? We can see why it, things are harder for, um, for salespeople right now. Yeah. What I thought would be interesting for us too here is to correlate this finding that we got from this group who's on the webinar with us today with findings we're seeing from some of our other data points. And let, there are two in particular that I wanted to show. Now, number one, we study thousands of salespeople every year around a diagnostic we call the selling skills index. And what that measures is a seller's intuition or ability to decide the right action in a given set of circumstances. So we provide these sellers with various scenarios and they decide what is the best option, second best option, third best option, fourth best option uh, in those scenarios. And then we score and evaluate those sellers based on that. So here's a meta-analysis of our data more recently. And, and what we find really interesting here, the scores here represent the uh, um, times in which uh, sellers selected the most effective option. Um, so you can see as you go through our impact process, which is a pretty intuitive sales process here, right? First, we investigate the opportunity that and we meet with the customer initially. We do probing or discovery questioning. Uh, then we apply or present our solution to the customer, do some negotiation and some convincing in handling objections, and ultimately then tie up or close the sale. So you can see the skyline here, the points in which sellers are telling us based on their assessments where they're most struggling, right? And that's in the probe area, really questioning, understanding, digging into um, build that relevant relationship with the customer. And in that tie it up, closing the sale in the final mile. So what's interesting here is we see some correlation between this and uh, what this audience here on the webinar was telling us. What I do want to point out here, and this, this is a critical point that we're gonna be making through this webinar, is that idea of probing, questioning and discovering, getting an understanding of your customer is important once you're in front of them, but it's also critically important to feed your investigation. You need to be thinking about understanding your ideal customer profile so that you can communicate to them effectively in that discovery. And this is something we're gonna talk about uh, some more. Michelle, any thoughts on this? You've been uh, instrumental in this selling skills index for, for many years now. And it, it, to me, it's just fascinating how it lines up with what this audience is telling them. Absolutely. And I'm I'm curious, I'm for the, the group that's um, attending today, let us know in the chat, does this surprise you? Are you, you know, if you are a, um, a leader, do you feel like this reflects your team? If you're a salesperson, do you feel like this is, um, you know, reflective of your own skill set. Um, a couple of points that I just want to make, this is on a hundred point scale. So, um, you know, a, a score of 47 on a hundred point scale on the probe step, clearly have a little bit of work to do on our, on our questioning skills. The other thing though, that I want to, to, to point out or emphasize is that apply step being the highest. So um, that's the highest score. The apply step uh, within the impact process is where we present our solution. So it's where we talk about our products or service. It, um, it is um, all about um, getting a proposal or a quote in front of a, a customer. So essentially we have um, sellers who are very focused on product information, features, getting that pricing and really not connecting with the questioning skills, really trying to understand the customer. Um, and then that therefore impacts their ability to close. So I think we put a lot of focus on product training, um, again, on those um, feature specs and that kind of thing, and not as much on understanding the customer. And that is such a critical point, right? We, we are very cautious, concerned, interested in being able to professionally talk about ourselves. Are we putting the same effort into being able to really understand and be relevant and um, connect with the customer. We're going to talk more about that because that is such a such a critical point. But there's one other thing that we we found very interesting. So number one, uh, what this audience was sharing with us is directly correlated to what we're seeing across the sales process here and in, in the weak points there. But it also 
shows up or manifests itself in a lot of behavioral, mental state, mental clarity uh, work that we've we've done recently. So we also assess the mental clarity, the personal skills of salespeople, and have done so with thousands of salespeople year over year for the last number of years. And what we're seeing here that's uh, interesting and, and quite concerning to us is that very consistent drop in uh, personal skill set among sellers. And, and remember, this is not, when we study this, this is not us just getting the opinion of salespeople like, oh, I feel weaker in these areas than I felt before. This is actual diagnostics assessments that assess it very objectively. So we, we know sellers are just not as capable in things like self-management, resiliency, their ability to self-start, their ability to solve problems, uh, goal achievement, personal accountability, all of those things. They are feeling weaker in those areas than they have in, say, three, five years ago. And what that where that concerns us is then we start to see a lack of confidence, a lack of that motivation that's needed to break through a lot of the barriers um, that have uh, come about really in this post-COVID environment. I think a lot of this, and, and we just saw the question raised here, why have these skill sets dropped since COVID? Well, I think some of them have dropped because we are encountering an environment today, and Michelle, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. We're encountering an environment today that's much more challenging. The problems are real. The challenges, the rejections, the issues that you're having to work through with customers are a lot more uh, real and pressing than perhaps they have been in the past. And so it's exposing a lot of um, like a lot of weakness that maybe wasn't as apparent in a stronger economic environment. Yeah, I would agree. I think the other element there as well is just change, right? So we have been in an environment of incredible change uh, really since um, 2020. These statistics represent a time frame of 2017 to through 2023. Um, and so we've just, as, um, as sales teams, as individuals, we have had to make a lot of adjustments very quickly. Um, you know, we've had to sell virtually, right? We, the world shut down just literally overnight. Um, we had to really rethink things. Um, there were supply chain issues. There were product availability issues. Um, you know, people have been buying more digitally. The world and our jobs as we know it have changed significantly. And this really does reflect in the mindset. This is a mindset thing. It's coachable, it's refinable, it can be um, developed. Uh, but I think just over a period of time of just intense change, it has impacted overall mindset. And you know, going back to those statistics um, that Spence shared a couple of slides ago, you know, in terms of um, sellers not making quota um, of, you know, thinking about or um, having mental health issues, all of this kind of plays into that. And it, again, becomes that, that loop. Um, there's a lot of fear, I think, particularly when we talk about selling through adversity in the current environment where deals are taking longer, it's harder to get people to um, commit to an appointment. Um, it's, you know, clients are ghosting us, right, before we can get, um, get an answer. And so that sort of plays into then um, your resiliency, right? The more rejection you get, the harder it is to bounce back, um, which then starts to really impact your ability to self-start um, and your own accountability. So it's all, I think, intertwined. And um, that's kind of the, the, the world that we're living in right now. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of, of comments in the chat, especially around um, the selling skills that we shared. Um, benefit dumping is a real problem, right? Um, probe stage is where people are seeing the biggest gaps. We had um, one person say, maybe it's the managers putting pressure on the sellers to get those deals in the door by the end of the month. Um, so, you know, it's, I think, um, I, I think our group is, is feeling a connection to some of these statistics, Spence. I agree. I agree. And, and uh, what's interesting, um, clearly we need coaching, we need development, we need you know, to really kind of put our arms around sellers, help them feel more confident and capable in the job. But I, there is a 
there's a key area we want to focus on here that we saw as the common thread throughout all of the, the issues that this audience shared with us. And so we felt as Michelle and I got together with others as well and talked about what we wanted to present today as solutions, that there really was one common area that we felt was most important for us to focus. And that's where we wanted to focus most of our time. And it really goes back to what you know, Dale Carnegie said so many years ago, right? That you can get much further, faster, and I'm paraphrasing here, but this is basically the gist of what he said. You can get further, faster being interested in others than trying to make others interested in you. And I think there is a lot of focus by salespeople right now on themselves and their own situation and their own activity and their own productivity and their own production. And really there needs to be, I think we can improve both our performance and our confidence in the way we feel about doing the job by really focusing on the customer, getting outside of ourselves, really trying to understand the customer because the, the better we can understand the customer, the better we can resonate with them, get that top of funnel uh, interest, help shepherd them through a buying journey that ultimately comes to a close in the end. So what we wanna focus on today are some ideas and some principles that we can take to our sales teams to really focus on understanding our clients or our customers. And the, the main concept here that, that we want to focus on, and we're going to tie some different ideas to this, is no one needs to buy something unless they want to do something. What is it that that customer wants to do? That's really what we have to discover. That's what we have to help our salespeople discover is what is it that that customer is emotionally driven to do? And you'll, you'll know if you're familiar with the principles of impact and what we talk about, we want to go right at that probe or that discovery step of impact and talk about what that's all about and connect that concept or that principle to our prospecting efforts and our late stage closing efforts. And let's start by talking about this three deep strategy. Michelle, as I understand three deep, there's really, and, and we use this analogy, right, of the tree and its roots, right? The tree is uh, what that customer needs to buy. And we as salespeople are often wired, you know, I have something to sell. So therefore people, I'm focused on selling something. So therefore those I'm talking to are focused on buying something. And that's not necessarily true, right? Individuals are focused on doing things, on making progress that they're emotionally driven uh, to make. And so our questioning or our evaluation, our thinking needs to be this three deep, which is at the highest level, it is what I need to buy. But underpinning what I need to buy is ultimately what I'm trying to achieve, what I want to do, what, what my goals and aspirations are. Buying things is only in service of those goals or aspirations. And then the layer below that, of course, is what are my emotional drivers behind wanting to do that, right? What gets me motivated or driven to want to do that, that then leads to me needing to buy things. And we need to have that foundational understanding and push for that level of depth with customers in order for us to really appreciate our ideal customer profile and message appropriately to that profile. You're right. And it's um, it's a deceptively simple concept. Um, you and I were discussing this earlier. Um, you know, it sounds pretty easy just to ask a question and ask kind of a follow up question and maybe another follow up question to really understand that um, that emotion, the why behind um, the, the purchase decision. Um, but it's hard. It's actually hard to put into practice because as, sell as salespeople, we are conditioned to think, okay, I got the need, I need to go on to the next question or uh, present my solution without really understanding that why. And those whys can be varied. It could be that your decision maker wants a promotion, right? Or wants to look good in front of their, their peers. Um, you know, so it, it's much deeper than just what the purchase is and how they want to use it. That's correct. Um, and uh, I appreciate you sharing that. So let's let's dive into this a little bit more and put together some kind of components of strategy around really getting to this deep understanding of the customer. 
So again, no one needs to buy something unless they want to do something. So what is it that they want to do? As we are thinking about messaging to our customer, trying to engage them initially or develop that relevancy or that connection to them, there's really four different components that we should be considering. And we're gonna walk through each of these four and kind of share some anecdotes and some data and really dig into each of them. So number one, what is it that the customer wants to do? And why is that so important to understand what it is that they want to do? Uh, number two, is the circumstance in which they do it. Why is it so important for us to understand the circumstance in which the customer would be motivated or driven uh, to do a particular thing? Number three, what makes that customer certain to decide in a particular way? And that certainty is a very important word. We're gonna come back to that word. What creates certainty in that decision-making process? And number four, who will be unable or unwilling to decide? And this fourth one is a critical component of this thinking as well. And, and we'll, we'll uncover the reasons for that as we go. So these are the four considerations around understanding the customer such that we can effectively message to them. Let's take a moment and go through each of these four and talk about them, discover them a little bit more deeply. Okay, I wanna start with an analogy or a story. And the question behind this story is, why do Snickers bars so, sell so well at airports? This story was first told to me by a gentleman who's one of the most brilliant marketers I've ever met. His name is Bob Moesta. If you ever come across any of Bob's books or things on the internet, you'll find his videos and such, you'll find him to be absolutely fascinating. Bob Moesta many years ago had the job of figuring out how to motivate or generate additional sales of Snickers bars. Snickers had tried a ton of different campaigns and ways of promoting the bar uh, to try to get people interested in it, right? You would have the commercials where it would show the nougat and then the caramel that would kind of lap over the nougat and the peanuts falling on it and then the chocolate covering it over. It was really like trying to use very uh, like emotional triggers for people, right? To try to get them interested in buying the Snickers bar. And guess what happened? Nothing. Sales were flat. And so Bob tried to kind of figure out what was it that pe got people buying Snickers bars, say, as opposed to other candy bars and such. And one thing that he noticed is that people bought Snickers bars in airports. Now, why would somebody buy a Snickers bar in an airport? It's because they're about to get on a plane. They're about to be uh, in the air for four hours. They know there's not food on that plane they're particularly interested in. Those pretzels never seem to do it for anyone anymore. And so they need something they can eat without a knife and a fork that'll give them some energy and some substance because they're probably missing a meal being on this airplane. So they're in that little overpriced store in the airport. And what do they grab? They grab a Snickers bar because the Snickers bar is hearty. It's got the peanuts. It's got all of those different components. So in a sense, they're not buying the Snickers bar because they are a particular demographic profile. They're not buying the Snickers bar because of all of the sensual imagery about the bar. They're buying the bar because it does a particular thing, a job for them. So what we have to ask ourselves with our product, whatever it is, is what job on the part of the customer is our solution helping them to do? <laughs> so, you, you, and we're this goes back. Oh, sorry. Snickers. Go ahead, Michelle. I was just going to say we're getting some love for Snickers in the uh, in the chat. <laughs> Don't you love it? It's such. I, I think honestly, I think that was my lunch all through high school. Unfortunately, like somehow I survived, but yeah. <laughs> um, it, the young body is very resilient, right? Um, this is a quote from the late Clayton Christensen that I think captures this particularly well, this concept, right? What's important is that you focus on the underlying job your customer has to do, not falling in love with your solution for it. And we need to be helping our sellers think very critically and clearly about what is the job our customer is trying to do and how does our solution help them do that job? We need to be messaging around that job not just around the features and the benefits of our solution. That's critically important to understand that. Uh, golf courses, yes. Eating a Snickers bar on a golf course. And the frozen ones are really, really good. My kids fell in love with those this summer. 
Um, okay, so that's that first point. We got to think about that job that our customers are trying to do. Now let's talk about the second point, right? This idea of the circumstance in which they do the job. Now, I love the story or the anecdote I love around this is Michael Dell, right? And before Michael Dell founded Dell Computers in college in his dorm room, he had a summer job. I think he was in junior high school, eighth grade or something like that. And he decided as a summer job that he was going to sell newspaper subscriptions. Now, the way people traditionally sell newspaper subscriptions is the same way I sold uh, Scoutorama tickets back in the day, right? You would go door to door in your neighborhood. You'd go house to house knocking doors. Now, in my experience, there was a kid in my neighborhood named John Holly, And what he did was he grabbed the school directory and he called all of the houses and got a pre-commitment to buy the Scoutorama tickets. So I was getting rejected at every single door. Um, so smart guy, John Hawley, he's probably a great salesman today. But the point with Michael Dell is he realized it took a lot of time and there was a lot of rejection going to every single door trying to sell newspaper subscriptions. So he hypothesized that really the two circumstances in which people would be open to buying a newspaper subscription were number one, they just got married and they're moving kind of jointly into a new residence together, or number two, they just bought a new home. Now, the great thing about those two circumstances is they're all recorded down at City Hall. So you can go and you can pull all the records of these are all the people who just got a marriage license. These are all the people who just uh, were new to a home. And he decided, I'm just going to knock on those doors. I'm not going to knock on every single door. And sure enough, he hit the exact right circumstance uh, for his particular offer and sold a tremendous amount of newspaper subscriptions. So many, in fact, that at the end of the summer, he writes up uh, the outcome of his summer and he turns in as an assignment what he did this last summer to his teacher. And he gets a grade back and it's like a C or something like that. He goes to the teacher and he says, why did I get such a bad grade on this? And she said, because you didn't tell the truth. He said, what about this was not the truth? And she said, there is no way you selling newspaper subscriptions for a summer could have made more money than I did as a teacher last year. But that was in fact true. So it's critically important as a second step, after we understand the job that our, that our customer is trying to do, to really think critically about the circumstance in which they do that job. This, when we can get that right, when we can really isolate the circumstances in which people are doing particular jobs, then some of these uh, intense signals that we may use technology to buy and to, to use become much more valuable to us because we're looking for very particular signals that are indicating a likelihood to buy. Michelle, any thoughts on that, on circumstances? I would um, encourage folks to check out our prospecting white paper. It's available on our website because we do talk a little bit about that um, in terms of trigger events. You know, what is, again, that circumstance for your industry or your product or service that then is a sign that they may have a, a potential need or use case for yeah, what you sell. Absolutely. That's a really important point. Understanding those trigger events, identifying those trigger events, doing the really the qualitative work to uncover those those trigger events. Some of the best um, work that I've seen around identifying ideal customer profiles is not quantitative demographic work. Right. Going back to the candy bar analogy, I don't buy a candy bar because I'm a 47 year old male. I buy the candy bar because there's a job I want it to do for me in a particular circumstance. And so oftentimes you have to do the hard work of evaluating, interviewing, digging out of your salespeople, you know, where, where has it worked? With what customers, in what circumstances has it really worked for you to engage? And can we find patterns in that and start to message to those patterns? It's really important, really deep work to do, and we need to be actively engaging our sellers in doing it. Okay, so let's move on. We've talked about the job they need. We need to understand the job our customers have to do. We need to understand the circumstances in which they do it. Um, here's another quote from Clayton Christensen just in moving on. Understanding the job is to understand what consumers care about in the moment of trying to make progress. That trigger moment, as you were saying, Michelle, very important 
We talk about that in the white paper. So let's move on. Uh, talking about the certainty that's needed in making a buying decision. This is one of my <laughs> greatest memories of growing up was this thing in the 1980s. And I remember this. I remember seeing this in the grocery store, right? The Pepsi challenge. So the question with this story here is, why do we still drink Coke, right? So back in the early 80s, Pepsi lagging significantly in market share to Coke is looking for some way to disrupt that market share. And what they know based on some um, data that they had gathered, some scientific research that they had done, is they were pretty confident that people like the taste of Pepsi better than Coke. So they launched this nationwide campaign, right? And they put all of these Pepsi challenge stands in supermarkets and they have people take a blind test, taste test, drinking a little cup of each of the colas. And then they would raise the, the box, right? And you're surprised by which one you select. Well, what's interesting, and you can actually see it in the picture here. If you look closely, you notice that the Pepsi preference is 58% and the Coke preference is 39%. So on a blind taste test, people actually preferred Pepsi to Coke. Now, what happens to Pepsi sales? Very little. As a role, it was a great kind of marketing campaign. It spoke very strongly to the people who bought Pepsi, but it really didn't change the dynamic. It took Coke actually reformulating itself to new Coke uh, for there to be an actual disruption in the market share. And then Coke was able to actually um, correct that by launching Coca-Cola Classic. But what's so interesting here is in the blind taste test, people preferred Pepsi, but they continued to buy Coke. And later psychological research, neuropsychology research around this kind of demonstrated why. When it was a blind taste test and they didn't know which cola they were drinking, people preferred Pepsi. The second they knew it was Coke and a researcher said, this is Coke you're drinking, this is Pepsi, they preferred Coke three times more than Pepsi because it was playing to a different part of their brain. It was not playing to that uh, those receptors that appreciated the sweet taste. It was playing to everything they remembered about the brand and the culture and the history of Coca-Cola, which is very interesting, right? That what people are craving isn't maybe necessarily something new, maybe something familiar. What they're craving is a degree of certainty around what they feel and know is good. That's what your customers are looking for. They're looking for certainty around uh, what is good for them. And you know, the great uh, psychologist and uh, mammalian psychologist, Jacques Pangsep, right? Who's most notably known for tickling rats was really good at isolating this principle. He isolated seven emotional systems in the brain. Yeah, the six here we're very familiar with, right? Fear, lust, play, care, panic, and rage, right? These are all emotional systems, some of them positive, some of them negative, that tend to motivate us to do things. But what's interesting, particularly when you think about messaging, and there's a lot of research that's been published about this, and I'd highly recommend digging into it, looking into this, because it's very fascinating. There is one particular system in the brain that is highly correlated with dopamine response that will motivate people to take action, particularly in buying things. And that system is called seeking. It's, there is something I want that I can't easily get. That highly motivates people to take action. The great playwright David Mamet always said, what is it? There is one thing and one thing only that keeps people in their seats during a movie or a play. And that is, finding out what happens next. That drives people to take action when I'm seeking something. I'm looking for something new, or I'm looking for something that will feel good or familiar to me. Everybody out there in this world has a seeking system in their brain. They're looking for something. And again, this goes back to why it's so important for us to do the hard work to really identify what it is that people want to do and the circumstances in which they want to do it, because that relates to their motivational drive for seeking something. Michelle, any thoughts on this? I mean, I, I think it um, just really ties back into everything that we've been talking about, right? It's 
um, understanding what it is, getting below in those questioning skills, right? Getting below the surface and understanding what somebody is looking for and the why. These are all, to me, much more emotional terms than just a rational, um, uh, you know, a, a, a rational decision. Absolutely. Let's make a couple of quick points here uh, around communicating this, right? We're trying to engage in our prospecting around this idea of seeking. And the first point that we want to make, and this is some research that comes out of the white paper that was just shared with this audience, which I think is really important to consider, is we look at the various communication methods to connect with buyers. What are buyers' preferred methods of contact or outreach from a salesperson? And if you look at, and these are ranked in order of priority, so the lower ones here are the highest priority upward from there. And if you look at it, it's really the ones we would expect, right? Email, phone call, text message. What this is telling us is there is no secret mode of communication to engage with buyers today. Many told us, 40% of you told us, this is the primary concern we have is getting engagement um, with our buyers. Well, the, the unfortunate, I guess, news is there is no secret new method of engaging. It's engaging, pe people wanna be engaged with the same way they've always wanted to be engaged. What it is, is the quality of the message that we bring. And we have to think about what message makes them certain that we're good. And this idea of certainty plays out in some of the research that we did here as well. Look at, look at this uh, second piece here. So this is, the question of how likely is a buyer to speak with a senior with a salesperson? Now, this is a study just of senior decision makers here. So these are those key critical people that you want to connect with. What are they most interested in that will drive um, them to engage with a salesperson? Look at the ones here on the left hand side. This is where they have the most the highest degree of extremely likely to engage. When they have previous experience with the seller or their organization, the seller or their organization was referred by a trusted source. Or you and your company has self-identified a need for the seller's product or service. So they need to feel confident. They need to feel certain that what they're looking at with you is good. You need to be messaging to that certainty. And you do that either by making it familiar with them, making yourself familiar to them, building that trust, demonstrating that value to them um, through referred by trusted sources. They're looking to have greater certainty in um, exploring something with you as part of their you know, decision-making process to engage with you or not. What's also interesting here is being dissatisfied with your current or existing vendor is not as strong a driver, right? Or even having that budget to, to do something not as strong as a driver. They need to be certain that what you offer aligns to what it is that they're trying to do. One of the best ways to build that certainty is to hypothesize what it is that they're trying to do, the circumstance in which they do it, and communicate directly to them around that. Michelle, any thoughts on this research as well? I think it's fascinating how it connects to the principles we've been talking about. Exactly, yes. And Trust beats budget. I mean, I think, uh, you know, in Impact, we teach that um, one of the most important qualifiers for an opportunity is that they trust you and your organization, that your prospect trusts you and your organization. And I think that is demonstrated out here, especially at the senior decision maker level, because that's somebody that can actually create budget. Um, if they see enough value and enough trust in what you have to offer. And I love all these comments over here in the chat around stop touching base, right? It's not about just checking in and just touching base. You have to have something of value to share. Completely agree with that. So it all comes down to, and I love this quote, if you, if you read Ogilvy on advertising, that classic uh, book on, on marketing and, and some of the things more recently that key people in Ogilvy, Roy Sutherland being one of them have talked about, this is such an important principle here. They said, people don't buy brand A over brand B because A is better, but because they are more certain that A is good. And those are not the same thing, right? People are not making, your customers, your buyers are not making a pure utilitarian decision about you versus your competitors. They are taking action when they're certain 
that what is presented to them is good for them and lines up with what they're trying to do. It's a very different thing. We are messaging to their seeking of certainty. Very critical to keep that in mind as we think about our ideal customer profile and find effective ways to message to them. Now, one more principle that we want to talk about here, and I think the best way to present that principle is to ask the question, who really uses Febreze? So Febreze is an incredible scientific breakthrough, right? It neutralizes those bad odor molecules and freshens the air, freshens the environment. And when the scientists that I believe it was Procter & Gamble first came up with it, they were super excited to use it. And they went out to try to figure out its marketing positioning. And they found a lot of scenarios or situations in which people had really smelly environments. One woman, for example, uh, worked in animal control specifically with skunks. And everything in her life was permeated with this, you know, skunk smell. And so there, that was the eureka moment, right? We can market for breeze as taking care of the smelliest of situations. So they put it out on the market and they advertise it that way. And sales struggled. They struggled mightily. And what they realized in that effort was that a lot of people out there in this world who smell bad either don't know or don't care that they smell bad. And that's a huge problem, right? They're not going to buy Febreze. So they reinvented the marketing positioning of it to people who cared about smelling good. And those are people who care about keeping their environment clean. And so the advertisement was all around the person cleaning the house. And then the last thing he or she would do is spray Febreze around as that finishing touch. And as a result of that change in positioning, it flew off the shelf. But I think what's important about the Febreze story is what it teaches us is that there may be, particularly in markets like today, people out there who have a really bad need for what it is that you are selling, but are unable or unwilling to transact around it. You have to add that layer in discovering your ideal customer profile. Who is in a position to be able to appreciate and take action against what we have to sell? Not just that they may have a critical need for it. Can they buy it? Can they transact around it? And I think layering in that detail helps us to target our messaging, target our approach to the right kinds of buyers. Let's talk a little bit about, Michelle, how this aligns to what we talk about as the kind of the role pyramid or the, um, the pyramid in any given organization. You really have three layers, level ones, twos, and threes in an organization. Threes are more, your most operational roles in just executing transactions. That's procurement, purchasing, administrative contacts that we may work with. These may be helpful to us in getting deals done, but they really don't have much decision-making authority. Oftentimes, we are selling our solution to that level too. Those VP levels, director levels, individuals who are tasked with getting things done in the organization and need to buy things as a result of that. Now, here is the key struggle in today's environment is level one decision makers, CEOs, owners, presidents, oftentimes are not clearly or closely informed around the solutions that are being decided on and can at any minute, particularly that final minute, veto that decision making process. And that's where we're seeing a lot of the, the late stage breakdown of opportunities is these individuals who weren't closely aligned to the decision making process coming in at the last minute and stopping the deal. This is something we have to be hyper-focused about as we're thinking about who is willing and able to make decisions. Are we arming these level two managers to be able to influence level one managers to make those decisions? Cool. Well, I know we have very little time here. We've been kind of talking about a bunch of Different things. Seth Godin very famously said, what you sell is best option for some people. It's not the best option for everyone. We have to figure out who's in a position to be able to buy what we have to sell. Um, just moving through really quickly because we want to get to our final considerations. Let's just recap what we've talked about. Our considerations in identifying and targeting our ideal customer profile. Number one, what does the customer want to do? What circumstance? Uh, are they most able to do it? What makes that customer certain 
of that what they're deciding is good and who of our customer set may be unwilling or unable in this current environment to make that decision. We feel like if we tightly focus on all of these areas and really push ourselves to think critically about them, we can strengthen our messaging and our strategy in building front pipeline, in strengthening our ability to motivate that late stage close, and also build greater capability of our sellers across the selling process, which were the three things individuals indicated to us today were struggles that you have. Michelle, any, any closing thoughts from you? I mean, I, I think this just really does require organizations, you know, whether you're a sales leader or you're an individual salesperson, just to sit down and do a little, a little homework, right? Just really thinking about your customer base, um, what, what triggers them to seek your product or service, right? Who is the best person to get to? How effective are you or are your teams at um, selling up or equipping those level two buyers to sell up? I think it's, you know, it's a matter of, I think this is a good team exercise for sales managers out there um, that really want to um, equip their teams to be more effective in this current environment. Awesome, thank you, appreciate it. Um, I just want to make a quick plug for uh, Michelle Richardson and Russ Scherer's book that we've been sharing with uh, a lot of uh, you on this line, a lot of our uh, clients, as well as prospects. Agile and Resilient gives a lot of good leadership-related, organizational strategy-related pointers around a lot of what we've talked today. It goes deeper into a lot of these principles. Highly recommend that book as, as a helpful resource. We have some immediate action steps here that we would recommend that kind of go a bit deeper in um, what we've talked about. We really appreciate the questions that have been highlighted as we've gone through these ideas. We'd love to engage uh, with this audience actively more. Please connect with us on LinkedIn, follow us on LinkedIn. We're happy to have a further conversation with you and we'll be sharing uh, some follow-up materials that we've talked about uh, after the webinar today. Yes, and I wanted to circle back around to a question that came in earlier. And if anybody has questions, um, feel free to, to enter those into the Q&A box. Um, but I believe it was Kellen that asked a question around, um, have any sales related skills improved during this time period? So this was kind of going back to those personal skills that we shared earlier. Um, and just that particular um, assessment measures uh, 23 personal skills. Some of them are related more specifically to sales, some to sales leadership. What we saw is that uh, 23 out of, I'm sorry, 22 out of those 23 personal skills um, had some kind of decline. The only one that did not decline was empathetic outlook. So uh, we are still empathetic as individuals, that was the only one though that did not have um, any sort of, of decline associated with it. Um, we do have a question here, um, Spence. So Kurt is saying the struggle is real. How can we continue motivating our sales teams? What's working and what's not working? It's a great question, Kurt. And I think it's one we wanna dive deeper into in other work that we're doing right now. I think number one is understanding what it is that motivates salespeople. And we, we've talked in previous webinars around a shift in that motivational profile. We really have to understand what our salespeople are looking for today. What are they trying to get out of their role in their job? And then tuning our coaching, our support, possibly even our, our compensation, our, our rewards and recognition to salespeople to line up to that motivational profile. And there are great ways to assess that motivational profile across your organization. Uh, that we can have more conversation about if anybody's interested. Yes. Um, and another comment that came through, and I kind of want to address as well, um, sometimes the customer isn't aware of the emotional why. Uh, so this is going back to that three deep concept. Um, so the customer isn't aware of the emotional why. So that decision maker uh, may be more transactionally driven. Do you have any thoughts, Spence, on how to kind of 
draw some uh, draw that emotional why out? It, it, it's a good, it's a very good question. I would say there is an emotional why behind everyone, um, be, be kind of behind every action that people are taking. I think the best we can likely do in those instances is hypothesize as best we can what is driving that individual and think about ways to connect to that message to that emotional driver. Um, even though I, I, and maybe think more broadly around that individual's role, what that individual is trying to accomplish, how that individual is compensated or rewarded in his or her uh, scope of work. Knowing, understanding various driving forces and motivational profiles is super helpful in doing that because you can kind of think more broadly around how is this individual wired? What is this individual interested in? Are they interested in knowledge? Are they interested in recognition? Are they interested, hyper interested in a return on their effort or their time? There's got to be something that generally motivates this individual to do what he or she does all day long. And if we can message or connect directly with that broader emotional trigger, uh, that likely flows into the quote unquote transactional thing that he or she is doing. I 100% agree. Um, I wanted to also just note for um, all of our attendees that, you know, a lot of the concepts that we have shared with you all today, um, you'll find in our impact selling program. And so many of you have probably been through that with us. Um, but if if that is of interest to you, or you see something that's uh, really resonates either for yourself or for your team, please feel free to reach out. Um, we have one more question here. Um, I think uh, one of the challenges that this particular um, participant is facing is that competition that the competition is essentially offering the same benefits, um, if not even offering benefits that they can't touch. So in other words, what if you're in a situation, a competitive situation where either your your competitors have something that you don't have or they have the exact same thing? What are your thoughts on that? My thoughts on that, let's go back to one of the, I think most resonant principles of social selling that, that I've heard. And I, I read it in a book, um, I think it was called The End of Marketing. Carlos Gill wrote it, if I'm not mistaken. And Carlos said something in that book that hit me like a thunderbolt. And it's it stuck with me ever since. He, teaching about social media. And he said, the people don't go onto social media to listen, but to be heard. And I think that's an important distinction. When you're talking about your competition, you say, well, they have the same benefits that we have. Well, if you're promoting your benefits, expecting people will listen when the benefits are the same from all of your competitors, it's not going to happen. What engages you with a particular individual who could be a customer is whether they feel like you hear and understand them or not. And that's something that, that can't be um, commoditized. That's, that's something that can't every competitor can't show an equal capability to do is to effectively listen and engage. So when you're thinking about these prospects or these customers of yours, how well can you listen to them? How well can you appreciate their situation? And that interest in them can be your differentiator, different than say the benefits or the features that you provide. So remember, they're not out there to listen, but to be heard, show them that you're listening to them and hearing them. And the one thing I would add to that too, Spence, is um, particularly if you're in a situation where your competition has benefits um, or some kind of element that you don't have, that's only really important if your customer is truly interested in those benefits that you don't have, right? So again, going back and really understanding what your prospect or your customer is interested in um, and being able to connect the value of what you offer to that, that's really the, the, the key thing. It's, it doesn't matter if they're not interested in those benefits, then that's not even um, or should not be an issue for you. So I think, again, that goes back to how sellers engage with their prospects and customers. And there's value just in that interaction um, in, and in the insights and perspective that, that salespeople bring. I completely agree. It's a great point. Yeah. Um, another question here. Um, price has been an issue. This is from Bruce. Um, thoughts on price competition? 
Well, I think price is the thing, of course, that people consider when they have no other elements to to consider in a in a decision. Um, when when all other things are equal or appear equal, then people go back to price. And I'll go back to the point we made earlier, right? People don't choose brand A over brand B because they think A is better, or in this instance, better priced, because they're more certain that it's good for them. And I think um, people are making decisions around price because they're kind of uncertain about the, the all of the different options. And so therefore, I'm going to take the safest bet, which is probably the, the cheapest bet, or at least that's the way they think in their mind. Remember, people don't come at this, your customers, your prospects don't come at this logically. They come at this psychologically. And in the absence of comfort, they're going to look for the thing that justifies their comfort or lack of certainty. They're going to look for the thing that justifies their certainty. And sometimes saying, well, I chose the cheapest one uh, justifies that certainty. So we have to give them reasons uh, to feel certain about something else. And there are always those reasons. It just depends on how well we message and build an appreciation for them. People buy more expensive things all the time because they're more confident, certain, um, and comfortable with those solutions. Agreed. Agreed. Well, that looks like all of our questions for today. Um, Spence, thank you so much for joining us. This has been um, a wonderful session. I've enjoyed um, the opportunity to, to talk about this topic with you um, and with this audience. I've so appreciated it as well. Thank you, everyone who joined us, who gave us your feedback, who's engaged with us. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed this, and I, I would hope and look forward to uh, many more dialogues and engagements like this. So um, appreciate it. Have a great rest of your workday. Thank you so much.